as Justin mentioned on the video, we're, we're coming into a new discussion series. We're calling it Summer in the Sermon. Uh, because we're going to spend this summer, June, July, and, and, and August, in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, this was a, a sermon that Jesus preached. You can find it in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And if your Bible has like red letters in it, um, those red letters mean that those are words that Jesus said. And you'll notice that in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, this is all red letter talk. This is G Jesus actually preached this sermon himself. So it's kind of cool. We're coming out of a sermon series called You Asked For It. And the topic of discussion was what we wanted to hear from God's word. But this next sermon series we're coming into is what Jesus preached and what he wanted us to hear from God's word. And he's going to hit on a lot of topics in this series. And so we're going to navigate through that together. But before we dive too far into the, uh, the actual teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, this weekend I'm actually going to do a sermon about the Sermon on the Mount. And some of you are thinking, oh, I hate when he does this. I feel like we're in an instructional class and stuff. I, I like it more when we do the inspirational stuff. Let's get into the content. Let's, no, I'm going to do a sermon about the Sermon on the Mount so that we can set the right framework before we go into the discussion. Uh, the discussion. Kind of like we did with the book of Revelation. We didn't dive in and look at all the trees, but we stepped back and looked at the forest so that you could have some of the right tools to be able to start to dive into it and look at it for yourself and have a better chance of understanding it. Well, we're going to do the same with the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and the cool thing about the Sermon on the Mount is it's, it's very easy to understand. It's very straightforward and very clear, uh, but though it may be easy to understand, it's not always that easy to apply. But we'll talk about why Jesus framed it up like that. But just because um, uh, I, I should say I, I wanted to start here with talking about the Sermon on the Mount, because we actually want to bring you into a deeper level of this conversation than we typically have. Um, and so how we want to do that is every week, we want to provide for you resources that we're just creating in-house here. Um, so today on your way out, you're going to be able to pick up basically a copy of the recap of the discussion that we had today for you to chew back through it, wrestle back through it, read some for yourself, make some notes. But you're also going to be able to pick up the discussion ideas and some questions and some scriptures that we're going to be talking about next week. So you're going to be a week ahead. We really want you to encounter God for yourself, by yourself or with people that are close to you in your life. You guys to wrestle through this, spend some time in God's word together before we come back on the weekend. Um, believe it or not, you showing up at church and us spending an hour or so together a week is not enough for your spiritual journey and your growth with Christ. This really has to go back to your home court and on your own turf. You having a daily quiet time, spending regular time with God in prayer, in his word, using some quality devotional books that are written by quality leadership, but also spending time in Christian community outside of here where you're actually praying and wrestling through God's word together. So we want to assist in that journey. And so as you take one of these today, let me just add another challenge to you um, for as you're preparing for next week's discussion, don't do it alone. Find people in your immediate vicinity, like for example, I bet you most of you have co-workers that come to Grace Bible. I bet you that most of you have a neighbor or two that comes to Grace Bible, or maybe family members or friends that are close by, and you say, hey, you know, I saw you picked up the thing too. You want to go through this just once a week on our Tuesday lunch break? And let's just spend 30 minutes talking through this, looking at the scriptures, praying through it. Start to develop some Christian community wherever it is that you are in the convenient places that you already are. I would encourage you to do so. Um, and we'll dive through these, uh, through each of these topics the, the next week after you've wrestled through it for yourself. But now let's get into the Sermon on the Mount. I think the right place for us to start this conversation is a right perspective of who we are and what kingdom we belong to. I know, that, I know that there are plenty of people that come to Grace on the weekends that they're not followers of Jesus Christ. Now, they're interested enough that they show up here. They may be coming with a friend or a family or a spouse or whatever. So, I mean, they're, you're, you're here, but you're not yet. You haven't given yourself up to this. You haven't surrendered yourself to it because you've got a lot of questions. It doesn't all line up for you just perfectly. Um, so first of all, I want to tell you, that group of you that are in here today, I want you to know that you are so welcome here. 
And this is totally a safe place for you to wrestle through that season of your life. As you're on kind of this spiritual discovery season, you're trying to figure out what is and what isn't and what is truth and what isn't, and you've, you've got your questions or whatever. This is a great place to do that because you're going to be loved here. You're going to be welcomed here. And, and we, now we're, we're going to be pushing you in the direction that, that we believe because we have a hope that we have found in the Lord Jesus, and we want you to have that same hope. But I want you to know this is a safe place for you to disagree with me. I don't mind you coming up to me on the weekends and saying, I don't believe anything you're saying. I'm like, cool. Because uh, a lot of these people uh, pretend like they do and then they just don't. Um, so I appreciate your honesty. Uh, you can do that here because we want to make sure that you're growing in your relationship with Christ. But in, these, in this conversation of the Sermon on the Mount, much of what Jesus is not just aiming at followers of his, but there's people who would have gathered around in the crowd who weren't followers of his yet. But for those of you that are followers of his, um, let me just try to set some framework for you. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are a citizen in the kingdom of God. I hope you feel just the gravity of those words. You are a citizen in a kingdom that is God's, where he reigns supreme. But now this kingdom is, man, honestly, it's unlike any other kingdom that you've ever observed in the history of the world. This is actually an inside out, upside down kingdom as compared to what we are accustomed to in this thing called life. In the kingdom of God, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. In the kingdom of God, the servant is the greatest of all. In the kingdom of God, success is not measured by how much you have gained, but how much you have given. Our king is the only king in history that instead of dishing out and pouring out punishment on the misdeeds of his subjects, he actually took the punishment upon himself for their sake. He's the only king in history that didn't take the lives of the unfaithful within his kingdom, but instead gave up his life though they were unfaithful. This is an upside down, inside out kingdom of which you are a citizen of. Now this can be very disorienting, particularly with the understanding that we live in a world where they're trying to convince us to believe that this relationship with God is a culture up relationship with God, not a kingdom down relationship with God. Here's what I'm talking about. We live in a world, most of the sermons you're gonna hear, especially by your favorite TV preachers, most of the books that you're gonna read are gonna be trying to help you manipulate the scriptures, the words of God to make sense of how culture up, how does this world I live in fit in to what God is doing? And that's a dangerous place to walk because you're gonna to try to redefine what God has already drawn clear delineations for. But this kingdom of God is not a culture up kingdom. It is a kingdom down. This is why Jesus said, as he taught us how to pray, he said, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, not the opposite. So learning to live in light of this, this upside down, inside out kingdom that God has called us to, it can be challenging and complicated at times in understanding it. And this is why Jesus preached for us the Sermon on the Mount. So we could have a clear view exactly of what kingdom citizenship looked like and what he was going to accomplish in and through those people that would walk faithfully with him. So let's start out at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5 of Matthew, verse 1 and 2. And it says this, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 says, seeing the crowds, say seeing, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and when he, what's that word? Yet when he sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, stop right there. We'll get into the Beatitudes or the beautiful attitudes in our conversation next week. But I wanted you to see these first two verses because I wanted you to see what prompted Jesus to preach this sermon to begin with. 
I want you to see the heart of the Savior that actually stopped what he was doing to preach to this multitude of people so that you can understand what is motivating Jesus to say these very words to us. And so I had you say that first word. I wanted you to see that he was seeing the crowds. He saw them. He saw their wickedness and their sinfulness, the jealousy, the anger, the hatred, the brokenness, the disease. He saw a multitude of people with a multitude of problems, just like what walked in here this weekend. And Jesus, seeing the crowd, saw them not for who they were, but for who they were meant to be. He stopped what he was doing and it motivated him to take a, take a step off of his path and he walked over and he sat on the edge of a mountainside and the crowds, the multitudes followed him over there to hear what he had to say. And after seeing the crowds and moving into a place where he could have some, some quieter time to, to be with them, the next thing he did is he, he sat down. Now, it wasn't uncommon for rabbis of the day, like when they got ready to, to teach a lesson, that they would, they would sit down. That was pretty typical. typical. But yet, the rabbis of the day, they would sit down in a position of prominence, almost as if they were lording over the people that what they had to say, those people needed to submit to. But yet, Jesus fulfilled in this moment a prophecy that the prophet Ezekiel had proclaimed many, many years before when the prophet Ezekiel claimed that one day the Son of Man would show up, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and he would sit amongst the people. Jesus not only saw them, for who they were meant to be and for who God created them for, but he, he sat with them and he began to speak to them, not in lofty language that they could not obtain or understand, but in a language that they very well understood and was very clear to them at their time in history. And I'm looking at this, looking at the heart of Jesus, what prompted the whole Sermon on the Mount, what prompted this whole famous moment in Jesus' ministry. And I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, looking at this like, if this was Christ's attitude towards the multitudes, if we are the so-called body of Christ, are we not as the capital C church called to those same three things? to see the multitudes of people right here in, our, in the heartland for their multitudes of problems, but yet not to see them as they are, but to see them as who they were meant to be as designed by God. And that we wouldn't just say, all right, good luck to the rest of y'all while we have church, but know that we would actually sit with them and amongst them that we would invite them into our churches, that we would roll out the red carpet to people that, that church people don't typically feel like belong, that we would actually run towards those people, that we'd run towards them in our workplaces and then in the community, that, that we would see people as messed up as they are, as messed up as we are, that we'd see them for who God has created them to be through the lenses of his love and his grace and his mercy and that we would run towards them and that we would sit with them and that we, would, that we would speak to them in a language that they can understand. And not words coming off of our heads or out of our mouths, but words speaking to them from our hearts. This is the calling of the church as modeled by Christ Jesus. And I wanted to make very clear the picture of what, what prompted Jesus to preach this sermon because I want you to understand, number one, what he's saying to you, but I also want you to understand what our calling as the body of Christ is to see and to sit and to speak with firmness and authority, but with great love and mercy to this world around us that desperately needs this life-giving, hope-giving experience with God for themselves. That's why we value experiencing God. That's what that thumbprint represents up there. Now, there's four things I want you to know about the Sermon on the Mount as you go into uh, your personal study of it and you're getting a week ahead on us. And I actually got these four things from Pastor Cam, so I want to give credit where credit is due. But these four things that you need to know about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the sermon that Jesus preaches, number one, it's simple. Say it's simple. All right, with a little more enthusiasm, look to the person to your right and say, it's simple. All right, number two, not only is it simple, but Jesus preached a sermon on the mount so that it would be practical. Say it's practical. 
Okay, not only is it practical, but number three, it's radical. Not only is it simple and practical and radical, but number four, it's personal. Yes, it's very personal. Let's look at those things together real quick as we kind of take little snapshots of the sermon so that we understand what we're looking at. Let's start with it's simple. It's simple. The Sermon on the Mount was meant to be simple. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Don't mistake what I'm telling you. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's simple. It's not complex or complicated. We make it that way. The Sermon on the Mount is actually one of those straightforward passages of Scripture, like the book of Proverbs, like the Sermon on the Mount, like the book of James. It's just very matter-of-fact bullet points. It's very proverbial. It's just like a, a cut-up of the highlights, the most important things that we need to hear. And no, it's simple. And I, I tend to believe that the whole Sermon on the Mount revolves around one particular verse. As if, as if everything Jesus is saying is pointing towards that particular verse, as if, if at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that these people heard, or at the end of this sermon series that we're going to have, that you would land in this place in accordance with this particular verse. It's Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 that says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Simple, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Yeah, the stuff you're worried about and dreaming about and praying about and anxious about and fearful of and concerned with and hoping to achieve and all these things will be added unto you. This is why I say the Sermon on the Mount is simple. Jesus didn't give a list of, well, if you do this seven-step process... You're going to be the Christian that God has called you to be. He gave, a, he gave you one because he knew we probably wouldn't do one well. He said, seek first the kingdom of God. Have him first place, as Colossians says, preeminent, first place in all things. Put me first, absolutely above everything else, and all these things will be added unto you. That's not to say that your family and your job and your promotion and your, your uh, social life and your vacation, it's not to say that those things shouldn't be priorities, but it cannot be the priority. You follow what I'm saying? This walk with Christ is simple. I didn't say it was easy, but it's simple. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Now, this is very simple, very straightforward. Now, it feels a little weighty, like, uh, easier said than done. Well, I'll tell you why. It's because we complicate what Jesus meant to be simple. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and we've actually rewritten that verse in our own hearts and in our own minds and our own way of living. We change one word that changed the entire meaning of the whole verse. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. We wrote it as, seek ye also the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Oh, now that's why our life's so complicated. Because even those of us that are under the illusion that we've made Christ the priority in our lives, chances are many of us, not all of you, many of you are seeking him also. Yeah, he's on the list somewhere really dependent on the day and the week and what else I have going on. But he's on there, man. Give me a break. It's interesting to me how Matthew, when he writes this together and he's quoting Jesus, right after in verse 33, and says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. The next thing that he says to conclude that chapter is verse 34. It says, therefore, seek ye first the kingdom of God Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious enough for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Last time I checked, if life didn't have any worry in it, life would be simple, wouldn't it? There's a direct correlation between the priority of Christ in our life and the level of worry and tension and angst that we have, isn't there? I wonder... If there's anybody amongst us, and I suspect that there are some, that can go back to a time in their life, a season in your life, or maybe even a day in your life, where Jesus truly was absolutely a number one. 
Whatever it is you're freaking out about wasn't the first thing that came to your mind when you got up in the morning, wasn't the last thing you were thinking about before you went to bed. Your pursuit of this promotion at your job wasn't the thing that consumes all your conversations and all your politicking and all your whatever. Like, no, there was actually a season. Do you remember a time? I wonder if any of you remember a time in your life where Jesus was absolutely at the top. Not to mean other things didn't matter, weren't important, but they were lesser. They were number two, three, four, five, and six, not number one. Does, I wonder if any of you remember a time in your life. Because I know that if you do, or I know that if you're walking in that right now, man, the peace that you've got, and I'm not talking about pretty looking circumstances. I'm talking about a peaceful, restful soul that though life may be throwing lots of craziness at you, like you are still before God. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, that, that's what Philippians talks about when Paul says that there is such thing as a peace that surpasses all understandings because it don't make sense. It makes no rational and logical sense, but some of you know that peace because there was a day or there's a season or you were in a season of your life or today is a day where you have truly said, you know what, Jesus, I'm gonna stop making all the mess a priority or all of my pursuits a priority. I'm gonna make my savior absolute top. And you've actually done that? Oh man, the peace, the power, the presence of God in your life is, mm. the, 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 the music, the, the hymn, that was written couldn't be any truer. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. This is what he's talking about. I, lo I love that the writer used the word strangely dim because the thing about it is, is you're not going to understand that unless you actually walk in that. And I tell you, the first time you do it and things in your life start to grow strangely dim, what concerned you, what freaked you out are going to start to minimize your concern about the diagnosis that you've got or whatever is just going to start to take a back seat to the peace that the Savior offers. Man, it's powerful. And the Sermon on the Mount was meant to be simple. It was meant to say, hey, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all that other stuff will fall in line. It's meant to be simple, not complicated. We complicate it. Not only was it meant to be simple, it was meant to be practical. Yeah, it was, it was meant to be practical. And... Um, it's simple and practical, look a whole lot alike, but just know that when we're studying through this together that we're going to talk about everything from food to clothing to worry to fear to prayer to other people, dealing with other people. How many of you are dealing with other people right now in your life? Uh, thank you for raising your hands. Hopefully they're not sitting like somewhere else in the room. That was awkward. That was meant to be rhetorical. Yeah, dealing with people. There's going to be a lot of dealing with people talk in the Sermon on the Mount. You'll see. And it's very, very, very practical. Once again, not easy. Practical. It's going to be so easy, it's going to bother you. If you're saying, man, it's harder than that. It's a lot more complicated than that. No, you are more complicated than that. Jesus' words are true. The principles are right. The truth is accurate. But we kind of get in and we write things and we mess things up. But this is very practical, especially when it comes to dealing with people. I know that one hits home for a lot of us. And I also acknowledge that, uh, that for most of us, most of our problems are mostly caused by other people. Um, and quite frankly, some of us are thinking, well, if so-and-so would just take another job out of state somewhere, like half of my problems would go away. Yeah. So <laughs> people create problems for people. That's imperfect people dealing with imperfect people is bound to end a catastrophe from time to time. But the Sermon on the Mount is so practical, it talks about things like that. It's going to talk about dealing with anger and retaliation and judging people and enemies and liars. And by the way, uh, just to give you an example of how practical what the Sermon on the Mount has to offer us about this thing. Do we have any liars in the room this morning? All right, all of you. Excellent. Okay, thank you for a delayed response. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, it, you know what the Sermon on the Mount says to, to liars, for example? It says in chapter 5, verse 37, it says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be somebody that walks with that much integrity, that when you say yes, you mean yes. When you say no, you mean no. And you stick to your word. It's that simple. Very practical. Very practical. Anybody judgmental in the house this morning? Don't raise your hand for crying out loud. I don't mean that literally. Any of you judgmental? You got judgmental problems? Uh, we're going to talk about that. It speaks to being judgmental. And chapter 7, verse 1 says, judge not lest ye be judged. That's the King James Version that I memorized as a kid. But don't judge unless you want others to judge you. Chapter 7, verse 12 also breaks out for us the golden rule. This is a famous one, and I also just happen to know the King James Version of that. It says, do unto others as you would have them do unto others. Yeah, absolutely. And you see how practical and how real what Jesus is telling the people that are listening to him in that day and what he's saying to us now. Yeah, the Sermon on the Mount is very simple, and it's also very practical. <laughs> It's also very practical, but I can tell you this, it is profoundly radical. And there are some places in this that are so radical, it's going to make you think, whoa, there's nothing simple or practical about that. Let me show you a couple of those places that I'm talking about. Back in the beginning, Jesus actually comes out the gate throwing radical talk at these people to set the hook and get their attention. He says in chapter three, these are Jesus's words, not mine. So take them as you will. That's the beauty of preaching the word, actual word of God um, is y'all get mad at me if you want to, because all I'm doing is telling you what he said. Listen, listen to what he says right here, coming right out of the gate. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, so they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Wait a minute, we can stop right there. None of that sounds like a blessed life to me. Because I'm hardwired in this mindset to having this culture up relationship with God. Instead of a kingdom down, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And he says living a blessed, blessed life is that we are meek that we do have times of weaknesses, that we do come up short, that we do mourn. He says, blessed are those who do those things. And there'll be more, we'll talk about those. But that's not what I've been told by the world I live in, even by Christians in the world that I live in. Because last time I talked to even some really godly people, and I said, man, how's everything going? Man, I'm so blessed right now. What do they mean by that? What they mean is, I'm either hitting it out of the park financially, I've either got wealth, health, or happiness. That's what we mean by blessed. And yes, all good things, all good and perfect things do come from above. But it's funny, if we were to sit Jesus up on the stage right here and have an interview with him, I'd say, Jesus, describe blessed for me. What does blessed look like? When you're truly blessing someone in their life, what does that look like so we can be looking out for it? He says, those who are mourning, those who are meek, those who are humble in spirit, those are the blessed ones. I wonder if that's you this morning. We'll talk about all those in detail, but I just wanted you to see Jesus is going to get radical in this conversation and his purpose because he wants to reorient your whole perspective of the kingdom of God. He wants to make very clear to you that this culture up mindset of the kingdom of God is a farce. That the real kingdom of God is thy kingdom come and thy will be done. He said, here's how God views these things. And we need to line ourselves up with God's version of the truth. Not our own stained and twisted and, and uh, soggy version of truth, but his. And we're going to get to see that in a radical way throughout the Sermon on the Mount. He's also going to pull some... Uh, pull some conversations on us and he's going to put it like this, kind of like your mama did when you were growing up. Now you heard it said that this was true, but I tell you that this is true. You heard it said that this is how you're going to have peace, but I tell you that this, you've heard it said that this is what, is, what, what matters and what's most important. But I tell you this, Jesus is going to do that a lot to us throughout this Sermon on the Mount. He's going to get radical because he wants to make us uncomfortable. So we start to move towards him and we start to realign our perspective into a God-centered, Christ-centered view of our life and the world around us and not trying to fit God into the lenses and into the world that we live in, but doing the absolute opposite. So not only is it practical, not only is it simple and practical and radical, but it's, last but not least, and this is really important, it's, it is personal, and I mean really personal. 
This sermon that Jesus preached comprised, after it got written out in the Bible, it ended up being roughly about 100 verses. So it won't take you long to go ahead and read ahead. Chew on it as you go. This is great opportunity for you to study God's word on your own for yourself with the Lord, encounter him for yourself. But this is so personal that out of the hundred verses that Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount, 65 of them contain the personal pronoun, you. You're going to see the word you about 65 times. That's most of the verses. Why? Because Jesus, Jesus was he wasn't speaking some high and lofty talk that people couldn't attain. His, 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 he was trying to appeal to the hearts of the people that he was engaging, that he had sat with, that he was speaking to. And I can tell you, Jesus has something to say to you in this as well. It's very personal. It's so personal that this sermon that Jesus preached was actually so meaningful to him personally he preached this whole thing on the Sermon on the Mount. If I had to guess, it's probably the same sermon that he preached when he fed the 5,000. If I had to guess, this is probably, he gave little snippets of this sermon every time he was sitting down in somebody's home to have dinner. Like this, this was what Jesus preached. Over and over again, bits and pieces all the time, and occasionally when, he, when he'd have a multitude of messed up people, he'd lay the whole thing out there on them. It's that person, it's so personal. Not only was this sermon for us, that Jesus preached it constantly to people to make sure that they got it, but it was personal to him. I know for a fact it's personal to him because the last time he preached this sermon, he re-preached the whole thing when he was hanging there on the cross that day without even opening his mouth. He re-preached with clarity this sermon on the mount while he was giving up his life for people that were enemies of his so that they could be set free. He re-preached the sermon and showed us what not returning evil for evil or insults for insults look like. He reached, preached a sermon and saying, teaching us how to turn the other cheek and forgiving 70 times seven and praying for those who persecute you and loving your enemy. All of this so that we could see what was possible through him. This radical countercultural kingdom come down as earth as it is in heaven kind of life that he's called us to, one that's peaceful, one that's powerful, one that's purposeful. And one thing that I can guarantee is that as we are preaching through this, as you are studying through this, there is going to come a time or two or ten that you're going to read what Jesus is saying and you're going to it's going to be really discouraging for you. You're going to see Jesus' words knowing they're coming straight from him, knowing that you, you can argue with the preacher, but you can't argue with Jesus, and you're going to read what he says, and you're going to get discouraged because Jesus is going to say some things to us that is going to make you feel like, man, I can't do that. You ever felt like that before? Probably ain't the first time, is it? Jesus' words are so powerful and so weighty that honestly for his audience then and for us as his audience now, he's going to be placing the idea of being able to please God. He's going to put it so far out of reach for us that, that our ending conclusion is going to be, I can't do that. There's no way. Man, I haven't committed adultery, but yet I have lust in my heart. Does that mean I'm an adulterer? Man, I haven't murdered anybody, but I, I'm angry at somebody right now. Does that mean I'm a murderer? Some weighty things. Man, I just read where it says that I can only be forgiven by God if I forgive other people. And man, I'm having a hard time with that. I can't do it. Dustin, you don't know what's happened to me. I can't do it. Let me tell you, time and time again, in this sermon that Jesus preaches, he's going to take the idea of pleasing God and put it so far out of reach for us. But can I just let you in on a little secret? It is that way by design. Jesus is trying to move you to a place of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and that being your priority. But in doing so, he wants to bring you to a place of recognizing and even saying to your friends and, and to me and to whoever at church, saying, man, Jesus can do that because he's Jesus, but I can't do that. 
I just can't pull that off. Don't you know that's, that's where the Savior wanted his audience to land that day, and that's exactly where he wants us to land right now. He wants us to come to a place where we're at the end of our rope and acknowledging that I can't do that. Only Jesus can do that, and his response to us is, you're right, and I plan on doing that in you, as you, and through you. Listen, don't, don't, don't be mistaken. Jesus coming and dying on the cross and being resurrected for our sins didn't lessen the standard of God on humanity. Not a, not a blip. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His standards of righteousness and holiness are perfect and unblemished, and that didn't change when Jesus came. But I tell you what did change is that God himself through his son, Jesus Christ, who gave up his life for us, gave us a piece of himself, the spirit of the living God to accomplish in us, through us, and as us, everything that he has set out for us. He can do that great work in us. We can't. Our one job, our one job in this whole deal is as the apostle John says, abide in the vine because apart from me, you can do nothing. Cling to the Savior with all you got. As Jesus himself said, let me just use his words, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Let's pray together. Every time I've stopped to pray at each one of our services this week, and I've just felt like, I just felt God whisper into my heart these exact same words every single time. That I need to be praying for us as a church. That throughout this next couple of months of diving into his word together, that there would be an awakening in the hearts of his people. That's, that's what he keeps giving me. There'd be an awakening in the hearts of his people. And so God, I submit to that right now and just ask that there would be an awakening in the hearts of your people. And that your spirit would go before us and do things that mere words and mere mortals can't pull off, that we can't pull off, that it's going to take the divine act of God in our lives and in this church to do. And God, we trust you and we know that if you said this to us in letters of red through your son, Jesus, it must be something we need to hear. And Lord, I pray that we would come to a place of meekness and surrender before almighty God, that we would seek ye first over and above all else and that we would cling to the vine, the life-giving vine of Jesus. And that there would be many Many, many of us that would reorient our perspective away from this cultural understanding of God's word and to, and to see it the way you design it to be. Father, thy kingdom come and thy will be done in grace Bible as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name.